Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I want to explain the context of the uh, title of the presentation, Strike While the Hour is Hot. It goes back to 2008. Barack Obama had just won. So it's like mid-November. And he, the, the president-elect's chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, just won another term as uh, head of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel was being interviewed by the New York Times. And they said, what in the world are you going to do with the problems of the day? I mean, it's been uh, a year into the recession. You have four and a half million people who are unemployed. The banks are in crisis. Wall Street has collapsed. The automobile industry is in crisis. It's the worst recession since the Great Depression. What in the world are you going to say that you, you're going to recommend to the president for managing the problems of the day? And he says, I'm going to say, never waste a crisis. Never waste a crisis. A crisis is good. If you want to make change, it's the perfect environment in which to make change. So that's the context of strike while the hour is hot. Crisis of dysfunctional government. So I'm saying dysfunctional government, yes, is going on. Yes, that's bad. But for you, it's an opportunity. Disruptive demographics. Our nation is changing so dramatically. The South is changing so dramatically. North Carolina, the people who live here. It's changing so dramatically, but that is an opportunity because of great change uh, affords opportunity. And then finally, the third topic, the keys to seizing uh, political opportunities. And then I want to end by addressing the compelling question, can you lead without a horse? Can you lead without a horse? Okay. <laughs> First, this functional government as an opportunity. I want to show you what this functional government looks like. Now, the National Journal for over 40 years has been ranking members of Congress from most conservative to most liberal on policies that are economic, foreign policy, and social. Those three categories, most liberal to most conservative, 40 years. Very, very reliable. Of the 430 members of the U.S. House, question is, how many Democrats are more conservative than the most liberal Republican? How many Republicans are more liberal than the most conservative Democrat? Now, back in the day in the old South, all the members of Congress from the South were Democrats and they were all conservative. And it was not uncommon at all for most of them to be more conservative than those liberal Republicans from New England. Right. So that created what's called the political middle in the mind of the National Journal. So 435 members of Congress. In 1982, the political middle totaled 334 of 435 members of Congress. That's a lot. In 2002, the political middle had shrunk to 137 of 435. The last time they did an evaluation of the House was 2013. The political middle totaled four. <laughs> It's gone. And the same thing is going on with the American public. You're either over here or you're over here, and there's nobody left in the middle. Crisis. In 2013, no Senate Democrat was more conservative than a Senate Republican. No Senate Republican was more liberal than a Senate Democrat. Not one. In 2013, only two Democrats in the United States House were more conservative than a Republican. Only two Republicans were more liberal than a Democrat. That's where you get the four out of 435. The middle is gone. So now you begin to see the dysfunction, the cause of the shutdown, the cause of the partisan bickering, the recalcitrance, the people in their corner, in their camps, refusing to go to the other side and hammer out a deal. But isn't there something that compels people to hammer out a deal in a democracy, the greater good? Well, what if your district was made up of people who said, you better not be caught hammering out a deal with the other side, because if you do, we're going to throw you out. And that's the world we live in. Those districts have been drawn now 
to where they are Democrat or Republican. And if you're a Republican, you better not be caught talking to those Democrats. And Democrats, you better not be caught talking to those Republicans or you will lose the primary. So that's where we are. But there's somebody we can blame. You always need somebody to blame, right? <laughs> we can blame the governor of Massachusetts in 1812, Governor Elbers Jerry. In 1812, Governor Jerry was in charge of redistricting. And he drew that map on the left. And a member of the Boston Gazette editorial team looked at that and he says, it looks like a salamander. And that's the editorial cartoon, the actual editorial cartoon that appeared on March 26, 1812 in the Boston Gazette, except they referred to it as a gerrymander. And from that day to this, it's been a mess. And now you know why. And now you know who we can blame. <laughs> Elbridge Jerry. Charlie Cook, who does what I do at the federal level, said last January at the beginning of the 2014 midterm elections, 93% of all Republicans in the House are sitting in districts Mitt Romney carried. 96% of all districts that Democrats hold are in districts that Obama carried. The House is sorted out. Where are the opportunities? Same thing went on in North Carolina. Of course, Republicans were in charge, thanks to the big Republican wave year of 2010. They took over legislatures all over America at exact time, the time where, uh, after the census, uh, the legislatures redraw the uh, congressional and legislative maps. So this is North Carolina's map drawn by Republicans. There are 13 congressional districts. Let's see how they did. Well, that was nice. They give the Democrats three. And they gave themselves 10. Now, these are drawn with such great sophistication that the Democrats have the three and the Republicans have the 10. And neither camp has any chance in any of those districts. If you look at the primary results, all of those Democrats won by better than 75 percent. Better than 75 percent. Republicans. The, the, the closest any Republican came to losing was like 12 points. And most of them looked more like the Democrat wins. They weren't close. Why? Because of the way the districts are drawn. And now you know the pressure on the Congress for compromising with the other side, for hammering out a deal on the budget. Well, you better not get caught over there with the Democrats if you're in one of those 10 districts. And so we, we've got this whole era of dysfunctional government created in great part by the way these districts are drawn. And if there's anything we need to do something about by 2020, it's how we draw these districts all over America. So all of a sudden, starting last fall, government became the number one problem in America. Now, Gallup, for 20 years, has asked this question, what's the most important problem facing the country today? And then they stop. The great thing about an open-ended question, you don't suggest anything. You just stop and see what people say. So the number one problem after 9-11 was terrorism. For years, it was terrorism. And then the economy took over. Jobs in the economy after the recession starts. Everybody's losing jobs, worrying about jobs, foreclosures everywhere. Value of property going down. It's a terrible time. Jobs in the economy rose to the top. 1994, it was crime. I'll always remember a friend of mine was in trouble with his campaign. He called me. He said, things aren't right. I don't know what's going on. It just doesn't feel right. I think I'm about to lose. I said, what are you running on? He said, education, roads, jobs, economic development. I said, let me do a poll. I did a poll. The top three issues were crime, crime, and crime. <laughs> I gave him that poll on a Friday afternoon. He calls his ad guys. By Monday night, he's running ads at standing by a cop car. They got the guy in cuffs talking about crime. Got to do something about crime. <laughs> so, Did he, win? he won. He actually pulled it out. <laughs> so, throughout this recessionary period, jobs in the economy have been the number one problem, right? Now, of course, we had problems with Iraq, Iran, terrorism, all those things 
clustered up at the top, but jobs in the economy were number one. But then about a few months ago, government went to the top as the most important problem. Here's the most recent poll. Now, the new one comes out about Thursday, but this shows you February and March. Look at the top. When you think about the most important problem facing the country, notice it says open-ended. That means they don't suggest anything. Most people say dissatisfaction with government. That is an opportunity for libertarians. Right there. The high level of dissatisfaction with a dysfunctional government. Dysfunction is good. Economy in general, unemployment, jobs, immigration, you see the list all the way down. February and March, dissatisfaction is at the top. This shows uh, a polling going back to 1979. The question is, in general, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the way things are going in the United States? Now, notice where it's lowest. About 1980, it's down to 12. About 1992, it's down to 14. And about 2008, it's down to 7. Do you all remember what happened those three times? <laughs> Reagan beats Jimmy Carter. Bill Clinton knocks out George Bush the Elder. Obama wins in 2008 and takes the White House back from the Republicans, but they also take the Congress. So that's just an example of when voters are dissatisfied, the potential for turnover is the greatest. And you can see right there some examples. And that's why I named the presentation Strike While the Ire is Hot. Looking at uh, the topic of dysfunctional government, the Tea Party, I think, is a great example of voters just being so fed up that they galvanize, they work together, and they make a difference. The Tea Party actually started in 2006 when it was conservatives who turned on Republicans. Now, a lot of people think it's conservatives turning on those big spending liberal democrats no it was conservatives turning on big spending uh, 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 conservative republicans they didn't have a name back then called tea party that didn't happen until about 2009 but 2006 they rose up and here was the problem so republicans are known for two kinds of values fiscal values and family values well here's their fiscal values a Republican-led Congress, there's a Republican in the White House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican House, approved a record 13,997 earmarks, 13,997 earmarks in 2005, a record cost of $29 billion. 2005-2006 combined, a Republican-led Congress approved that many earmarks, costing $56.3 billion, and ran up a $371 billion deficit. 340% growth in uh, money or earmarks since the Republicans took over in 1995. And, of course, all those budgets were signed into law by a Republican president. So that's Republican fiscal values. Right? Now you know where the Tea Party came from. Now let's look at Republican family values. These are the faces. <laughs> these are the faces of Republican family values. In 2005, 2006, fraud, sex, fraud, sex, sex, fraud, sex, fraud, fraud, fraud. <laughs> All right. In 2006, Republicans lost the U.S. Senate. Harry Reid became majority leader. In 2006, Republicans lost the U.S. House. Pelosi becomes speaker. No Democrat member of Congress or Democratic governor lost in 2006. The country turned on Republicans, including Republicans. Republicans turned on Republicans. They stayed home. Let the Democrats have it. So now Obama's president. No, wait. Bush is president. He's still president. He's got two more years. He's got two unpopular wars, a banking crisis, home values are down $6 trillion, automobile industry crisis, real estate, $4.9 trillion debt increase. Obama's not in there yet. Katrina disaster, Wall Street meltdown, TARP, that's the bailout, 4.4 million jobs lost, a great recession is underway, and we lost trust in 
Republicans. Now you hear about Obama's job approval being in the 40s. In 2008, President Bush had an average job approval of 27.4. Bush's 25% job approval in October of 2008 was one point higher than Nixon after Watergate <laughs> and two points higher than Harry Truman in 1952 after he fired the very popular General Douglas MacArthur and no other presidents have been lower. So it was real bad. <laughs> Satisfaction with the direction of the country at seven. And now you begin to see why it was such a great year for Democrats and why Obama won. Obama won because he wasn't the other guy. <laughs> so 2008, now Obama's in charge. Democrat wave election year. You've got Democratic Congress. You've got a Democrat governor in North Carolina, you've got a Democrat legislature, and here's the list of problems. Same old list. Two unpopular wars, banking crisis, housing, automobile industry, Social Security, Medicare, BP oil spill, Wall Street bonuses, $787 billion stimulus, trillion dollar budget deficit, 1930s unemployment, $13 trillion debt now. Who do we lose trust in? Well, Obama says the most important domestic priority was health care. Now, that's the list. You think with that list on the screen, everybody's waking up thinking about health care? So Obama got in trouble because he put his priorities ahead of the voters' priorities when we we're in the middle of an economic crisis. There was no poll that showed health care at the top of the list in 2009, 2010. And so he got himself in trouble. He got all Democrats in trouble because he put his agenda ahead of the public's agenda. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Hillary, Hillary won't be doing it. I can't think of anything more important than making sure that you're talking about what the voters are waking up every day thinking about. Let me give you an example. Got another call. This is a House member. Somebody I met earlier from Gaston County. You might, this guy's from Cleveland County. Shelby's the county seat. He said, John, I'm worried about my campaign. It doesn't feel right. Something's wrong. I said, what are you running on? Education, jobs, economic development. I said, let me do a poll. <laughs> so I do a poll. Open-ended question. What's the most important problem facing Cleveland County today that the legislature can do something about? That's the way I always worded it. You know what it was? The Highway 74 bypass. That was more important than education and jobs and anything else because the traffic had just become so terribly bogged down going through Shelby. It affected economic development. It affected getting to your jobs. It affected everything, and people were tired of it. Highway 74 bypass was the number one issue. He changed all his materials to Highway 74 bypass, and he won. <laughs> but that's why Obama got in trouble. He said, my agenda is more important than the public's agenda. Nope. Got himself in trouble. Got all Democrats in trouble. Dysfunctional government, dysfunctional, <coughs> led to a Republican wave in 2010. Voters flipped 63 seats in the House from Democrat to Republican. Largest gain by any party since 1948. That's how bad the backlash against Obama was in 2010. That was the same year that something impossible happened in Massachusetts. Teddy Kennedy, the lion of the Senate, a Democrat from Massachusetts. There is no way a Republican is going to win Teddy Kennedy's seat. No way a Republican won. That's how bad it was in 2010. Democrats go from 51, 57 down to 51 seats in the U.S. Senate. They lose the U.S. House. They go from 255 Democrats to shift to 242 Republicans. Obama says we took a good shellacking. In North Carolina, Democrats had all the power. They had the governor. They had the state uh, Senate. They had the state house. And they lost the state Senate and the state House for the first time 
in like 112, 14 years. I think it was 1896. But this is what happened. Democrats didn't think they were vulnerable. They had all the power. They had drawn the districts. Now, see, Republicans don't think they're vulnerable today because they've drawn the districts and they have all the power, right? They drew the districts. Why worry? They had weathered many corrupt leaders. Remember, this is the era, a 10-year era, where so many Democrats went to prison. Meg Scott Phipps, head of agriculture, went to prison. Speaker Jim Black went to prison. A member of Congress, Frank Balance, went to prison. A member of the House went to prison. All kind of people got in trouble. John Edwards. Remember him? <laughs> John Edwards. Beverly Perdue. A lot of her people got in trouble. Mike Easley's people got in trouble. It was a terrible time for Democrats. But they had weathered corrupt leaders. They had weathered weak governors. A Democrat polling firm said that Beverly Perdue was the weakest governor in America. A Democrat polling firm. Public policy polling. But they had weathered weak governors. Turnover of legislative leaders. Unpopular presidents. Obama was unpopular. Budget crises. Anti-establishment voters. Declining party loyalty. Low turnout. High unemployment. Unpopular wars. Surges in Republican strength. They had weathered all that before. But never at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened in 2010. So. 2011, 2012, oh my goodness, what are the most important problems? The list hadn't changed. And American public is just looking for somebody to solve these problems. Jobs, housing crisis, net worth, unemployment, one in six are living below poverty, 47 million Americans on food stamps, $16 trillion debt. We've now had the first U.S. credit downgrade in history. We're borrowing 43 cents for every dollar we spend Lost trust in who? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. So what do you get when you don't know who to blame? You get a status quo election year. Two billion dollars was spent, wound up with the same president, same Senate, and same house. Here we go. 2013, 2014, the debt's up to 17 trillion. Still borrowing all that money, all the people still on food stamps. All kind of crises. Again, we have lost control, uh, 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 respect, I think, for most of our leaders. And this is when you start seeing dissatisfaction with government move to the top of the list of the most important problems. 2014 midterm election results. Republicans have taken every governor's uh, uh, seat now in the South except Kentucky and Virginia. In 1990, there were no Republican legislative chambers in the South. After 2014, Republicans have 25 of 26. Only Kentucky has a Democrat chamber. In 1964, all members of Congress from Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, and South Carolina were white Democrats. After 2014, none. The last one, the last white Democrat, falls in the deep South. Folks, this is disruptive demographics. You, you, you can just see disruption, dysfunction, as all these changes are resulting, driven in great part by voters angry at whoever has the power. Here in North Carolina, Senate and House has super majorities after 2014. The Supreme Court's 4-3 Republican. Court of Appeals is 8-7 Republican. 10 of 13 members of Congress are Republican. Both U.S. Senators are Republican. Sheriffs, still 52 Democrats, 48 Republican, but getting close. More Republican county commissioners happened all over the nation. State legislative control map in 2010. Now, blue is Democrat, red is Republican, green is split. Now, look at what happened. In the U.S. House, largest GOP majority since 1928. We're talking about numbers changing. 83 women in the U.S. House, a new record. 62 are Democrats, 21 are Republicans. 47 African Americans, the first African American woman, a Republican woman from Utah. 29 Hispanic members of Congress, 22 are Democrats, 7 are Republicans. Two Native Americans, 12 Asian Pacific Americans. 173 members are not white guys. 
That is dramatic change. This is what's going all over America, that kind of change. And I think change creates an opportunity for libertarians. The U.S. House on 11-4-2008, this is before the Obama era and that 2010, the backlash against the Democrats, 2014, another backlash. You see the numbers, you see the map. Look at after 2014, what happens? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. U.S. Senate, 94 of 100 senators, non-Hispanic whites, 20 women, 14 Democrats, 6 Republicans, 2 African Americans, including 1 Republican, Tim Scott from South Carolina, 3 Hispanic, including 2 Republicans, that's Rubio and Cruz. One Asian American, two independent, uh, independents who caucus with the Democrats, one from Maine, one from Vermont. So big, big turnover that favored Republicans. But do our voters saying we want Republican solutions to problems? <laughs> so Gallup says, Gallup says, what do you want this new Congress to do? Now, this is like a week after the elections. Answer. Fix yourself. <laughs> Listen to the people. In the gridlock, compromise, cooperate, work things out. Then we get to economy, jobs, wages, national debt, other issues like health care, immigration, education, war, and terrorism. Fixing yourself is more important than war. Because we're not going to get rid of these problems until you fix yourself. That's the whole problem with the problems. <laughs> but surely with this Republican takeover, voters wanted something Republican. Well, CNN does a poll. November 21 through 23, 2014, where Republican victories in the U.S. Senate and House races in 2014, a mandate for Republican policies or a rejection of Democratic policies, mandate for Republicans, 16%. Rejection of the Democrats, 74%. So they were not saying, we want you to go do Republican things. They said, we've given up on the Democrats. We're giving you a chance to work on that list. Just work on the list. So now you see why dissatisfaction is tops in the latest Gallup survey of the most important problems facing the country today. <laughs> And I hope you sense now, after seeing what's happened in previous election cycles, why I say, strike while the hour is hot. Okay, that's topic one. Topic two deals with disruptive demographics. Now, here's a fascinating question. Look at the blue counties. What percent of Americans live in the blue counties? Take a look. Think about where they are. Miami, New York, L.A., 35 percent, 30 percent, 45, 45, 45, half of all Americans live in 146 of 3,144 counties. That's half. Half of Americans live in those blue counties. Wow. The other half live everywhere else. Now, let me put that in perspective. Wake County has a million people, right? Montana doesn't have a million people. <laughs> there are more people in Wake County than Montana, than North Dakota, than South Dakota, than Delaware. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so what's going on nationally is huge, and I think it's something very important for libertarians to stay on top of, and that is the entire population is shifting to urban areas. That's where all the growth is, and that's where all the growth is going to be for the next 20 or 30 years. What's going on here in North Carolina? We passed Michigan in 2014. We're now the ninth most populous state. Wake and Mecklenburg counties have over a million people each. They are ranked 44th and 41st, respectively, as the largest U.S. counties out of 3,144. 
Wake and Beckenberg counties each have more people than Delaware, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Alaska, Vermont, or Wyoming. Either one of those counties. Folks, that's disruptive demographics. The growth of urban areas as a dominant political force in American politics. Here in North Carolina, half of all our voters are in 13 counties, the other half are in 87 counties. Half are in 13 counties, the other half are in 87 counties. Half of our voters are in those 13 counties. Those six counties, Wake, Mecklenburg, Guilford, Forsyth, Durham, and Buncombe, cast a little over uh, a million votes in 2014, same as the lowest 77 counties. Six counties, same as 77 counties. Six, seventy-seven, way the same. So, disruptive demographic, dramatic changes taking place. Half of Hagen's votes in 2014 were from eight counties. The other half were from 92 counties. Why is that? Because urban voters like Democrats more than Republicans. The more densely populated a, a people are, the more likely they are to choose Republicans over Democrats the more likely they're to be pro-government than anti-government. Because urban people live in congested areas, so they want something done about congestion. They also like art centers. <laughs> they like sporting arenas. They like jogging paths. All this stuff government provides. Those are the eight counties you see that Hagen won. Uh, she got... 686,503 votes in those eight counties till us only 452,956. So you can see a dramatic advantage in urban counties for Democrats. And that's, that's true if you look at all the presidential races. So since 1990, we've gone from 3.3 to 6.3 uh, million voters. 64% are not from the South. And this is what has changed North Carolina more than anything. Two-thirds of our voters are not from the South. They're all from Connecticut, every single one of them. <laughs> in 2012, half of North Carolina voters were ha native and half were not native. Half were native, half were not native. Can you feel how that is changing the politics of this state? Jesse Helms could not get elected in North Carolina today. Could not because of what you're seeing on the screen. Now, more about these folks that have come here from somewhere else, the non-natives. So a study was done of all the non-natives, and this is a national study. It was really just fascinating. So we're one of the fastest growing states on the East Coast. As recently as 1980, 76% of the residents were natives. Today, it's only half. Today, there are twice as many North Carolina residents born in New York as were born in South Carolina. Twice as many from New York as from South Carolina. Brad? <laughs> so if you look at non-natives, two-thirds are not from southern states. And we're going to continue to grow between now, according to UNC Chapel Hill studies, between now and 2060. We're going to be adding a million people a decade. It's all going to be urban. And this is how it's impacted us. We were Obama's closest win in 2008. We were Romney's closest win in 2012. We have become a perfectly balanced swing state. That's why it's so expensive to campaign here, because no one has an advantage anymore. No one has an advantage. Perfectly balanced. That's why it cost $130 million on that U.S. Senate race last year. So, our world has changed. Disruptive demographics. It's affected our ideology. This is a study done by Gallup based on all their 2014 polling. A look at all the states, most conservative in the red, below average conservative, more liberal than conservative in the blue. Where are we on the ideology scale? Average. Here are the top 10 conservative states. Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Utah. Western states, southern states, but not North Carolina. Top liberal states. We are right in the middle. This is a look at party identification. Solid Democrat or leaning Democrat in the blue, leaning Republican, solid Republican in the red, 
Why are we competitive? These are the most Democrat-friendly states, Massachusetts, Maryland, Rhode Island, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Republican Advantage, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, South Dakota. Where is North Carolina? Well, you would think with all the Republican domination of this state that we would be more Republican. In fact, we are the 28th most Republican-friendly state, much closer to the middle of the nation. All southeastern states except Florida are more Republican-friendly than North Carolina. All. Why? Because we went from 3.5 to 6.5 million voters in 20 years. Two-thirds are not from the South. They're all from Connecticut. <laughs> all right, overall registration. This is as of April the 1st, 6.3 million voters. Democrat, Republican, unaffiliated, Libertarian. Now notice the blue line. That's Democrats since 1980. They used to have about three-fourths. Now they're down to 41.5. This is disruptive. <laughs> Republicans are the red line. Notice around 2007, they went up, and then they started coming down, and they continue to come down. It's the unaffiliated voters, the independent voters, those that could care less about the D's and R's. They had the choice. They had the opportunity. They chose not to be a D or an R. There's now 1.7 million unaffiliated voters in North Carolina. 1.7 million. 27.5%. Republicans only have 30.6%. Almost as many unaffiliated voters as Republicans. Democrats down to 41% at 2.6 million. Libertarians, 25,899. But you can see your potential with those who are not looking to the legacy parties for leadership uh, in that uh, number of unaffiliated voters, 1.7 million. Tremendous opportunity. There's also opportunity uh, for uh, growth among uh, uh, libertarians. Uh, when you look at the advantage women have in the state, you see the total female voters, male voters, 54.3% female advantage over 45.7% uh, male. In 2012, the gap between the number of female and male, male voters exceeded 490,000 out of 4.5 million. 490,000. That's huge. That can win any statewide race for the courts, for Council of State, for Governor, U.S. Senate, for President. It is huge. Half of all adult women in America over 18 are unmarried, 56 million, up from 45 million in 2000, accounting for one in four people of voting age. Single women are among the Democrats' most reliable supporters, second only to African Americans. Two-thirds voted for Obama. Think Hillary Clinton in 2016. You can just see the opportunity. But back to North Carolina, there have been, since 2000, 45 races that came down in the fall between a male candidate and a female candidate. The female candidate has won 34 or 45 times. This is statewide races, like Secretary of State Elaine Marshall, Governor Purdue. 34 or 45 times. Our treasurer's a woman. Who else? Labor Commissioner Cherie Berry. Um, education, June Atkinson. Auditor, Janet Cowell, 34, 45 times. So women have become a very, very powerful political force in this state, and that's going to continue to grow, and uh, women make truly exceptional candidates. Back to the registered voters list. This is looking at those independent voters. So you have the unaffiliated at 1.7 million. Libertarian, 25,899. But look at this. There are 48 counties out of 100 where the number of voters registered unaffiliated is greater than either the Democrats or the Republicans. That's significant. But look at this. This is the list. 
I'll let you look at that a minute. So you're saying that they're greater than one of the parties? One unaffiliated. of the two. Unaffiliated. Unaffiliated are greater than one of the two. All right, but look at this list. In four North Carolina counties, unaffiliated voters outnumber both the Democrats and the Republicans. Currituck, Dare, Transylvania, and Watauga. Currituck has 106 Libertarians. Dare, 168 Libertarians. Transylvania, 103. Watauga, 454. Tremendous opportunity in those four counties. I can just see y'all dividing the state into a contest, the East versus the West. <laughs> They come up with a list of goals to register, to recruit, to get the candidates on the ballot, and to compete with each other. East versus West, four counties where there is much more support for third party or non uh, uh, legacy uh, party candidates. Uh, the greatest lack of support for Democrats and Republicans in the state Darren Currituck, Transylvania, and Watauga. So, Disruptive demographics, big, big, big time going on in North Carolina. Fast becoming an urban dominant swing state, metropolitan voters more moderate than conservative, more Democrat than Republican, more pro-government than anti-government, more socially diverse and tolerant, offset by those suburban and rural voters who favor more Republicans and less government. Welcome to North Carolina. <laughs> Disruptive demographics. Growth in America, younger voters, especially millennials, those born between 1980 and 2000, and minorities. Minority states in 2014, there are four. Notice Hawaii. By 2060, uh, there will be 22. Yep, North Carolina. So once again, thinking about growing the Libertarian Party, you have to think about younger voters, minority voters, women, people of color. In 1960, look at the bottom of that list. White people, 85%. In 2020, it goes down to 60. In 2060, it's down to 43. Hispanics go from 4 to 19 to 31. A third of all voters in 2016 will be Hispanic. African Americans stay the same at about 13. Once again, thinking ahead, growing the Libertarian Party thinking about where to invest your resources, the constituencies that are growing. Also, this group, the millennials, I cannot emphasize them enough. I think this should be your number one target. They have now overtaken the baby boomers. More millennials than baby boomers. Wide ideological divide by generation, according to Pew Research. Notice the bottom line, that's millennials, the blue, that's a combination of 13 and 28. So what does that add up to? 41% are either consistently liberal or mostly liberal. Look all the way over the right, the red and the pink, that is 12 and 3. That adds up to 15. 41, 15, 41. Millennials, the most liberal generation in America today. So, and their numbers, as I said, they are also the largest and are uh, taking over very, very quickly. Um, so it's really important to look at them. So the keys to seizing political opportunities, finally, keys to seizing political opportunities for libertarians, focus on the next generation. Urban, younger, smarter, more diverse. The millennial generation is the largest in U.S. history. 92 million millennials, 61 million generation Xers, 77 million baby boomers. Embrace their technology. Millennials are three times as likely to stay connected via text messaging and social media as baby boomers. They have different attitudes towards ownership. The sharing economy, like Uber, is growing. People are sharing their houses with each other. We're entering an era where we're going to shell, share mixers. We're going to shell, share drills. We're going to share everything. Why do five houses on a cul-de-sac each need a lawnmower? 
when we can share one good lawnmower. So we're entering this sharing economy, and those who are leading us into the sharing economy are the millennial generation. They are cost conscious because they have less discretionary income than previous generations because of unemployment challenges as they became of age and got out of college and had to live with their parents, couldn't find jobs, and of course they all have that debt. And there's nothing worse than debt when you have a lousy job or no job. So that's the era that millennials have entered the world of work in. They are only half as likely to be married and living in the, uh, their own household, 23%, as baby boomers, 56%. That is a huge difference. Politically, per Pew Research, Changing Face of America's Millennials are Social Liberals. However, after carrying Obama to the White House in 2008 and 2012, they have been drifting away from the Democratic Party. And they are not Republicans. Half of all millennials call themselves independents. There is your opportunity in the coming generations, the millennials. So that's where we are. And now the compelling question, can you lead without a horse? So I went to Washington to make a speech. And it happened to be a speech to a business group about the decline in uh, business participation in politics, business leaders playing leadership roles in, in politics. And I was really struggling with it because I don't, I don't speak about leadership. That's just not my thing. I just politics. So I'm struggling with the speech. I'm sitting in my hotel trying to figure out what to say about leadership. Won't come together. So I went down to Starbucks, had coffee, came back, it just got nowhere. So finally it hit me, wait a minute. I'm in our nation's capital where we celebrate all of our great leaders with monuments and plaques and parks and statues. I think I'll just go for a walk. I think I'll go and look at all those monuments and statues and read those plaques and see if I can figure out something to say about leadership. And so off I went. This park and read all the plaques stared at everything, went to this park, then went to this one. After a while, I was convinced that in order to be a great American leader, you had to have a horse. But I kept walking. <laughs> Something told me it wasn't a horse. And so I kept walking. And I kept reading the plaques. And then finally it hit me. Every single one of them had this in common. One day, they simply took a stand for a worthwhile cause and didn't quit until they prevailed. Every one of you can do that. That's the key to success in politics. Thank you very much. Should I take questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, be happy to take questions. Anybody have a question? Going once, yes, sir. Your analysis nationally is the Republican Party gut shot and dead. Gut shot and dead. Or dying. Well, you see the movement to the urban counties. And let me put this in, in perspective, what they struggle with as far as the Electoral College. Half of Obama's electoral votes were from five states. Half from five states. You start with half your votes if you get those five states. And he's got them because they were big. Without urban, hard. huh? Without working hard. Right. They're already his. Because they're like these big urban dominant Democrat friendly states. They're just already yours. So that's the big struggle that, that Republicans are facing. They have the West. They have, like I showed you, the, you know, here's our two little counties, Mecklenburg and Wake. They have Montana and they have South Dakota and, and, and uh, North Dakota and Wyoming and Utah. They have the huge states, but the people are concentrated in these Democrat-friendly urban areas, and that's the big struggle for Republicans. Democrats are not... Um, socially uh, conservative in these urban areas like Republicans are pushing them on a lot of the cons social conservative issues of the day. And that's getting them in trouble. And if they get in trouble with urban Democrats, how do they ever win back the White House? I just don't get it.
And the, they also get in trouble on the economic side because people really are struggling. People really are struggling financially, trying to find jobs. Minimum wage is wholly inadequate. I mean, we all know that. You can't raise a family on a minimum wage. So we're in a terrible fix. All the jobs are in China that, you know, folks used to be able to have. We've just become a global community, but we're all still sitting here in the United States looking for opportunities to make a buck and raise a family. And where do you look? I mean, so we're struggling. And, uh, and there are too many Republicans that still have the uh, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps attitude. And um, I think, once again, that insensitivity to the number of Americans, uh, especially millennials, who are struggling uh, uh, to find unemployment, to pay off college debt, uh, to make uh, payments for health insurance policies like my son, who is paying 500 something dollars a month for a Blue Cross health insurance policy and has a $13,000 deductible. $13,000. He has to pay for that insurance policy. He's going to pay something. He's really looking forward to getting an MBA this fall because he'll be at Chapelfield and he can go on their insurance thing. But right now, that's what he's paying. And that's what he gets for it $13,000 deductible. So we've got serious problems. And um, and I think Republicans have the perception, although I know from a personal experience all my life of working with Republicans that as people, they are, are genuinely wonderful people, just like Democrats are. But as a party, they appear to be callously insensitive to the struggle of many people. And I think uh, millennials are picking up on that. Urban Voters they're in trouble with, and that's where the growth is. Millennials they're in trouble with, and that's where the growth is. Minorities they're in trouble, that's where the growth is. You saw the numbers. Millennials, minorities, women they're in trouble with. So did that answer your question? Not dead, but, but have really gotten themselves uh, into a jam with a lot of voters that are going to be calling the shots in the very near future, perhaps as soon as 2016. Yes, sir. So uh, you talked uh, quite a bit about the millennials being uh, 91 million in the upcoming generation. Right. Uh, do you think that the millennials will be more to be proactive and to go after the millennials? What would you say is the most important proactive move to make sure that we can capture that? Uh, that's a great question. The question is, what's the most important thing that we libertarians can do to get to go after millennials? Remember the story of the Highway 74 bypass? Remember the story of crime, crime, and crime? That's what you have to do. You cannot assume that you know what the most important problems are facing any constituency in this country. You have to start investing in research. To find out, okay, if we want to go after millennials, what are the issues that will move them to back libertarian candidates? What's the type of libertarian candidate, the personal qualities that they want to see? Certainly, they're going to want to see somebody from their generation. We all do. So, but you have to do the research. That's the critical thing, because you're going to be surprised. Questions? Yes, ma'am. How do we counteract the media's spin that people who believe in small government and individuals are uncaring and heartless, don't care about the poor, the starving, the unemployed, the minorities? Yeah. When we do, we want them to be <clears throat> at the table with us, not feeding them at the back door as the Democrats would. Yeah, I don't think there's there's anything you can or should do about it other than to continue to state your case, continue to participate in the shouting match that is American politics today. So you just have to be a part of the shouting match. Uh, I wouldn't be defensive. I would just stay on, on, on a very positive uh, a forward march towards this is how we would like to lead the nation. These are our priorities. This is why we believe what we believe. We feel really great about it. Don't care what you say. This is what we believe. And this is what motivates us to believe what we believe. <clears throat> There's nothing you can do about people saying ugly things about you. I write this, this weekly uh, blog 
you know, it's called the John Davis Political Report. I got two comments that my children just fell out of the chair reading. I mean, this this one guy uh, ended by saying, you know, something like, may God bless your soul or I don't know, save your soul or something like that. I mean, just unbelievably bitter things. There's nothing you can do about that. It's like you think of all the conservatives that want to create the perception that Obama's a lousy president. Well, 20 years from now, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be creating the perception that he was a great president. And there's nothing either side can do about any of that. So uh, I think you just have to be in there in the shouting match. And that's American politics today. Just shouting. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. And if I can shout 100 times to your 50, then I'm probably going to win the argument. So you just have to all keep shouting. And being in there and, and making, speaking up, you know, recruiting candidates, having the people in part of all the dialogue, the local, all the different races you can get involved in, being a part of the dialogue. Questions? Yes, sir. You are going through your disruptive demographics. And as you're going through that, one of the thoughts that came to my mind was with the concentration in some urban areas, do you see more strength? in the movement to do away with the Electoral College and go to a popular vote? There very well could be, but it's not something that I think is going to be anything in any predictable future. There will have to be an event that all of a sudden it collapses the public behind that move. But just under the routine uh, uh, unfolding of election cycles in America, it is simply not going to happen. Um, said that information gathering is so important. Obviously, a lot of our candidates run with very limited financial backing. Right. How often or how frequently does someone need to be doing that type of polling, seeing that it usually isn't the cheapest thing out there? Uh, this is a great question, you know. So um, polling is expensive, so where do you poll? Urban areas are expensive. It costs a million dollars to win a Senate race in Wake County, a state Senate race, a million dollars. Common flat fee. It's just the way it is. So you're a libertarian. Where are you going to get your million, right? Problem. Well, how about Dare County and Currituck County? How about Transylvania County and Watauga County? You can compete there. And that's where there is a greater receptive constituency for you to appeal to. Watauga County, full of young people, millennials, full of very progressive thinking uh, young people. Um, so, you know, you can pick, I, I would pick a short list of targeted counties and then put all of your resources in building up from there, getting people elected there, city council, county commissioner, school board, whatever, and then build and build and build from there. But if your resources are severely limited at a time, that $130 million state Senate race and U.S. Senate race and a million dollar state Senate races all over the state, I think you just have to be very strategic. Um, you know, I mean, I've, you, you've all seen organizations grow and flourish and the tea party would be the most recent that comes to mind that were just regular folks and all of a sudden you know they start building and building and building and they wouldn't let go they were relentless they were in those members of congress's face you know in those town hall meetings back in 2009 they were relentless and eventually they made a huge difference 2014 they were out of vogue but they were in vogue for a good six years That's I was asking the frequency. So do you feel like poll major polling uh, is necessary every 60 days, 90 days, 120 oh, days? All right, back to polling. So first, I would limit the polling to opportunity areas. All right. And then do the polling. Uh, you know, you should always start with a benchmark poll and then you do tracking, you know, scattered throughout, depending on resources. But uh, because of technology, polling is really affordable today. Um, I mean, voter contact through technology is very affordable today. Um, I mean, the story of what Obama introduced in 2008 and again in 2012, the technology, the data mining and moving voters and contacting, 
I mean, he 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 worked through. He got people to to send the headquarters in Chicago the, the the Facebook friends. They let the Chicago people mine their Facebook friends, and then they had you saying, "Hey, are you registered to your Facebook friends?" So it's not anybody in Chicago. It's you. Are you registered? Then you are saying to your Facebook friends, "Hey." Could you send Barack Obama five dollars? Not a hundred dollars, just five dollars for ten months. Just let us tap your card. Five dollars for ten months. We don't want a hundred dollars. We just want five dollars. You see. And so, then have you voted? Have you voted? Have you voted? Friends contacting friends on Facebook. It was just phenomenal what they were able to do. So, once again, that is affordable. And millennials, that's the way they talk to each other, texting. Right. We have five kids. My wife, Kathy, and I have five children. Not a single one of them have a phone in their house. Not a single one of them get their TV through Time Warner Cable or any other cable source. You know, they're all, but they all watch anything they want through the Internet. So uh, it's, it's this millennial generation will help you. Figure out a way to get these polls done cheaply and get voter contact done cheaply through technology. Yes. There is a perennial debate within the Libertarian Party between whether we should pool a lot of resources into a few races right. or we should flood the zone and just run every race possible in order to, to kind of show the flag and, and really look bigger than we are. Do you have any insight from your analysis of the data, which of those strategies is more likely to be successful from our position as a, as a, a new political party rather than an entrenched one? Right. I think it's important that you have that presence as many places as you can. Um, but as far as recruiting candidates and running candidates, I would be very, very pragmatic about resources and uh, and um, and go where you can truly concentrate resources and win campaigns. So I, I guess do both. So as, as a combined strategy, would you think it would be effective to say, we're going to run candidates in all 100 counties, but then internally we know that we're going to dump money into four. And then maybe they don't see that coming, that there's four... Four races where all of a sudden they, they seem like a lot more organized than they are in all these other counties. Well, it's performance based. Yeah, that's that's so, how I would kind you know, of pick the, teams. The, the, this, and this uh, been able to do this. This kid has been. These guys haven't done anything. So. Yeah, I would build with uh, teams of people that that take the responsibility for a list of stuff to get done, and that includes, you know, a lot of things like voter registration drives and all that. Um, but now you need your face out there in as many places as you can, but resources are limited in, in, in politics. You just have to be practical. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.